Hi, it's Ellie, and I'm going to be talking to you about global warming and evolution. Ooh, goody. Now, the first topic is global warming and why it's not real. The ice caps in Greenland are actually getting thicker. Huh? Just like Y2K was not real, but everybody thought we were going to die. Seventh grade physics shows that CO2's molecular weight makes it very heavy. It can't rise high enough to cause the greenhouse effect. Okay, so a 14-year-old kid has outwitted all those thousands of scientists who don't realize that CO2 is a heavy gas and would therefore stay at the bottom of the atmosphere and asphyxiate us all. Well done. Now on to debunk evolution. And then next is evolution and why it's not real. The only reason they think that we progress from apes is because they needed an animal that there are not very many of, so that we will believe that there is that that the, is the reason that there are not as many of them and there is so many more of us. Huh? They may they never think of giraffes and elephants to being compared to us. I don't know something about giraffes and elephants. Yes, it can be so frustrating arguing with people with the mentality of 14-year-olds you want to chew your own leg off. So in this video I'm going to show you how to take on these conspiracy theorists, creationists and internet junkies and have fun in the process. I'm not saying my method is foolproof or that I have all the answers, but if you like these ideas, give them a go. It's certainly less painful than chewing off your own leg. Dog shit, uneducated buffoon, dumb f blind arrogant ex hippie, asshole. Boys, boys, the first rule in arguing with assholes is don't treat your adversary like an asshole. Come on, degenerating into a mud fight is what he or she wants because it leads away from your strongest suit, which, if you're fighting on the side of science, is measurable, observable, documented evidence. In many cases, these guys are not assholes anyway. They're actually very nice people who have three things in common. They tend to believe whatever they read or misread on anti-science blogs. They can never, ever admit that they got something wrong. And they all think they know better than the experts. Case in point, I'm not disputing that increasing CO2 will cause warming, but it all depends on how much. From my own investigation into the subject as a citizen scientist, I think the warming... Thanks, Chipster. What a wonderful word to describe citizens who learn their science from the internet. Citizen scientists. The term is usually applied to ordinary people who help researchers when a huge amount of data is needed. They don't necessarily have much of a science education, and they certainly wouldn't presume to know more than the experts. What Chipster means by a citizen scientist, and the definition I'm happy to go with, is someone who doesn't necessarily have much of a science education, but who does presume to know more than the experts. And based on what he's read on the internet and in the Daily Mail and figured out for himself, the citizen scientist is even bold enough to tell us that the experts are wrong. Which means he believes that either the experts are all incompetent, or they're all dishonest and have deliberately fiddled the figures. Citizen scientists never, ever consider a third possibility that maybe the experts know something they don't. The second rule is, well, let's see if you can guess. There's been an effort within the scientific community to censor out information uh, against evolution. So what do you do? Tell her, no, there hasn't. That's simply not true. Get into an insulting slanging match and strangle her with a scarf knitted out of her own self-righteousness. Or three, be polite and ask her what information has been censored out. I go for the third option. So if my first rule in arguing with arseholes is not to treat them like arseholes, the second rule is don't argue. I know, that rather negates the title of the video, doesn't it? But entering into an argument with a creationist or a conspiracy theorist just gets your blood pressure up and sheds more heat than light. Getting this woman to answer a question like what information has been censored out will not only stump her and highlight her complete ignorance, it'll force the woman to think. Yes, it can happen. Well, how about gravity? What about it? Well, if it, uh, it's a little bit like a magnet. If you have a small magnet and a big magnet, yep. the big magnet's the one that's going to pull the little magnet around and not the yep. little that's going to pull the big one. Yes. So if you compare the Earth next to the, uh, the Sun, yep. which one's going to make the other one spin around? Uh, yeah, the Sun will make the Earth spin around, yeah. Dissecting claims with a scalpel certainly gives people more pause for thought than bludgeoning them with a hammer, 
like this. Yes, well, you, you know what your problem you is, Congress? You're an you elitist. To, no, you, you think you're above is, the American people. You no, no, that's that's the problem. Problem. You don't let me finish. What worries your adversary isn't someone who simply shouts opinions, but someone who asks penetrating questions and won't fall for evasive answers. I was entitled to express my views. I was entitled to be consulted. Did you threaten to overrule I, I was not entitled to instruct Derek Lewis, and I did not instruct him. And did the you truth threaten of, to overrule the, him? The truth of the matter is that Mr. Marriott was not suspended. Did you I threaten did not, to overrule him? I did not overrule Derek did Lewis. Did you threaten to overrule him? I took advice on what I could or could not did do. Did you threaten to I overrule him, Mr. Howard? I acted scrupulously in accordance with that advice. I did not overrule Derek did you Lewis. threaten to overrule him? Mr. Marriott him? was not suspended. Did you threaten to overrule him? I have accounted for my decision to dismiss Derek Lewis did you threaten in to overrule great him? detail before the House of Commons. I note you're not answering the question whether you threatened well, to the, overrule him. The, the important aspect of this, which it's very clear to bear in mind... I'm sorry, I'm going to be frightfully this. rude, but... Yes, you but can... I, I'm sorry. <laughs> It's you, a quite you can straight put, yes you can or put the no. question and I will I will give, yes you, no I will give you an Did answer. Did you threaten to overrule him? I discussed this matter with Derek Lewis. Yeah, that's what worries them. Single-minded, unflinching pursuit of an answer. Finding that killer question isn't hard because whereas the hallmark of science is consistency, the hallmark of junk science is inconsistency. Why did these amphibians de-evolve losing their legs? In the end, the answer is irrelevant because evolution will simply make it fit. Answers are not because evolution conforms to whatever evidence it is presented with because it is not science. <laughs> what? Ian, that's the very point of science. It's meant to fit the evidence. In other words, evidence comes first, then the conclusion. In junk science, it's the conclusion that comes first. Now, I should point out that in science, we talk about the overwhelming preponderance of evidence because in every field of science, there are always going to be a few anomalies, and that's why scientists do research. But the overwhelming preponderance of evidence has to be consistent with the theory. In citizen scientists' world, if the overwhelming preponderance of evidence is inconsistent, then the citizen scientists will either change it, as we've seen many times, or simply ignore it. All you have to do is ask questions to find out where the claims of the citizen scientist and the evidence don't match. When it finally dawns on him that things don't add up, he'll go through contortions to try to avoid answering the question. Here's an example from one of my video fora. Someone called the clunking fist accepts that an increase in CO2 causes the Earth to warm up and that it's done that in the past. But he claims these high temperature conditions never stayed around. That's contradicted by the fact that these high temperature conditions lasted millions of years. So the obvious killer question is, how long did these hothouse conditions last? If Clunking Fist admits they lasted millions of years, he's contradicting his own hypothesis. So rather than admit he's wrong, he has to avoid answering the questions. In all, I had to ask six times, but of course I never got an answer, just an interesting mix of evasive responses. Now, it's not a difficult question, and the answer's pretty straightforward. When someone goes to such lengths to avoid answering a question, you can be pretty sure he knows he's been caught out. In that case, you may wonder, why don't these guys simply give an honest answer and abandon a claim that's so obviously inconsistent with the facts? Why go through the painful process of having to avoid a question again and again, when all you have to do is say, whoops, my mistake. I know. Weird, isn't it? If a competent scientist discovers he got something wrong, he'll simply acknowledge the error. If that changes the hypothesis, then, as Ian Juby pointed out, the hypothesis changes. But remember, in citizen scientist world, the conclusion comes first, so the conclusion can never, ever be wrong. Refusing to answer six times is nothing. The record so far is held by someone called Kierbird, after he claimed my climate change videos had ignored scientists with the strongest evidence against what he calls large-scale AGW. It took me 15 attempts to try to get him to give me the names of the scientists I'd supposedly ignored so that I could check out this strongest evidence. The excuses for not revealing them were varied and fascinating. 
Google it. I've already named them. I refuse to engage in a link war. I accept the science. You don't get to dictate the rules of our chat. This is not my central point. You already know their names. I won't give you the names because you'll attack their credibility. I may have posted the names elsewhere on another thread. I've repeatedly answered your question. You know the names. Now, if I had the strongest evidence for something, I'd only need to be asked once, and I wouldn't hesitate to say what it was. Of course, watching citizen scientists squirm like this does make these encounters far more fun than shouting abuse and getting frustrated. But there's also a serious side to this. Personally, I'm fascinated by how one part of a human brain can know that something's wrong, but the other part still clings to a belief that it's right. It's fascinating to see the variety of excuses that are served up to keep the two halves of the brain from colliding. And there's a polemical reason for asking questions as well. In my experience, citizen scientists often try to keep their statements vague and ambiguous so they can change their claim when they get caught out. In fact, watch for the subtle change of claim as you're questioning them. So ask questions to establish their position very clearly right up front. And it helps to feign ignorance. Remember, these guys think they know better than the experts, so never make out that you're smarter than them. That only invites suspicion. If you want a role model, don't choose a smart ass like Hannity. Choose this guy. I'm sorry, sir. Just one more thing. You said that your nephew was planning on coming to your party. Yes, sir. And he called just to say he was going to be a little late. That's right. And that was a costume party. Well, sure, you were there. Had you told your nephew that? Say what? People trying to hide something are much less on guard when they think they're dealing with an idiot. Play dumb, be respectful, and they'll only be too happy to try to teach you their pet theories in detail played out on a long line knotted with inconsistencies. All you have to do is wait until they've played out enough line and then reel it in. Ignoring evidence is one thing, but when a citizen scientist changes the evidence, then you need to compare his claim to the primary source. Honestly, I don't trust uh, ra you know, radiometric and carbon dating at all. But uh, you know, bear with me here. Here's a little article from a, an, an article. As with facts and evidence, the citizen scientist will often be evasive and obtuse when asked for a source. For example, data is not a source. I could claim the sun orbits the Earth and cite astronomical data as my source. It's meaningless. As Z. Shogun did here, ask for the title or author of a paper that reached this conclusion based on that data. You'll usually find there is none. Neil Adams, the comic book illustrator who thinks the Earth is expanding, gives his source for a claim as geology textbooks. Doesn't say which ones or which page number, which is just one step up from the other common answer, everyone knows it, or look it up. For a source to be meaningful, it has to be something you can check, which of course is why the citizen scientists don't like to give it. As soon as they do give a source, their argument falls flat. A living mollusk shell, carbon dated at 2300 years old. Well, here we are, 14 years later, carbon dating is still not working. Here's our old friend Kent Hovind trying to show that carbon dating doesn't work because he claims living mollusks were carbon dated at 2,300 years old. Unfortunately for Hovind, he gives us a source, a scientific paper by Keith and Anderson. That may impress other citizen scientists who get all their information off the internet, but for people who fact-check, this is so easy to debunk. As even the title of the paper suggests, Keith and Anderson weren't trying to carbon date a living mollusk at all. They were carbon dating its shell. And since the carbon in the shell came from very old calcium carbonate in the water, it gave a very old date. The purpose of the paper was to show that you can't derive the age of an aquatic animal by carbon dating. So what do you do when the citizen scientist flat out refuses to give a source? The usual excuse is, I won't engage in a site war. Well, I have a few solutions. First, try googling the claim verbatim, because citizen scientists often can't or won't write their arguments in their own words. They'll just copy and paste it. You'll soon find out where it came from. When a date differs from that expected, researchers readily invent excuses for rejecting the result. The common application of such posterior reasoning shows that radiometric... And thanks to Google Images, it's also possible to trace the source of faked photos as well. This one, which Jesse Ventura's conspiracy show claimed was taken in the Northern Hemisphere just before the Boxing Day tsunami... This photo was actually taken just before the big tsunami hit the coast of Indonesia. ...turned out to be a poster photo taken in Australia. You can buy it off the internet.
Here's a technique I tried when a YouTuber called Laurel Bush refused to give up her source. She messaged me with a familiar internet story that Vikings had been found buried in permafrost in Greenland. After several fruitless attempts at getting a source, she told me of course to look it up, I simply pretended I'd found it on my own. I invented a scientific paper from the University of Copenhagen, and I said that according to the paper, the bodies were skeletons, meaning they must have decomposed and couldn't have been buried in permafrost. All bullshit, of course, but it had the desired effect. About to be gazumped by this twaddle, Laurel Bush immediately came back with a quote to show I was wrong, and bingo, I googled the text she gave me and found her source. Now you'll notice that I'm lumping all these various junk science beliefs together. Even though I often get emails from people who tell me well, they accept the theory of evolution, but not the theory of plate tectonics or climate change. That's like telling me you believe witches fly on broomsticks, but you're not gullible enough to believe that tooth fairies leave money under pillows. It's hardly something to be proud of. Science isn't a pick and mix based on your religious or ideological beliefs. But the reason I lump you all together for the purpose of this video is that your approach in arguing your case is exactly the same no matter what scientific theory you don't like. Cherry pick or distort the evidence to fit the conclusion you've already reached. Get your science information from blogs that share your beliefs and never check them. Find a couple of experts who disagree with the majority of researchers and quote them endlessly to give the impression the scientific community is divided or get someone with doctor or professor in front of his name and pretend he's an expert, even if he's never published anything in his supposed field of expertise. Say that all you want is for both sides to be heard. Draw up a petition of scientists who support your case, even if they have no qualifications in the relevant field. How to explain the fact that few scientific papers support your case? Claim censorship. And why don't most scientists support your theories? because of course they're all either dishonest or incompetent. Never entertain the possibility that they know something you don't. Now I'm sure all the citizen scientists out there will say, well we can do exactly the same thing, potholder. We can ask questions too and stump all you science nerds. But it doesn't work that way because those who accept science aren't coming up with wacky theories of their own that they have to defend. We're simply quoting what's in the scientific literature. Now you might be able to show that we've erroneously misquoted the science, that's happened to me quite a few times, and then all we have to do is admit that we got it wrong and correct the error. It's that easy. I, in fact, I wish citizen scientists would ask more questions because then they'd be able to get some answers which they won't find in the places they usually go for information on science. In fact, most of the questions I've seen are incredibly easy to respond to. When I googled questions evolutionists can't answer, I found these question evolution questions, which have even been made into a t-shirt, and a host of other lists. I won't have time to go through all these questions, but you'll find the answers in the video description. When I googled questions warmists can't answer, I found these two, and these rather innocuous questions prompted a few more questions on a discussion forum, also answered in the video description. But if you don't know the answers, don't worry. Remember, you don't have to pretend to be an expert. You simply have to quote what real scientists say. If you don't know, then say you don't know. It's sometimes interesting to then ask the citizen scientist, well, what do the scientists say? He can never admit he doesn't know, so listen to whatever answer he makes up and ask for a source. Despite all this, a lot of people probably still think that citizen scientists sound persuasive. After all, why shouldn't their beliefs be just as valid as the conclusions of real scientists? And why can't their web pages be just as legitimate as peer-reviewed papers published in respected scientific journals? Well, let me just ask one final question. If you're happy to get your science from a citizen scientist, then would you be just as happy to have a root canal performed by a citizen dentist?